Well, uh, my, uh, my approach is going to be a rather different, uh, more qualitative and perhaps less quantitative approach than the uh, previous two speakers, but uh, I'm uh, hoping, having uh, listened to their fascinating presentations, it's going to be uh, uh, interesting and, and complementary in significant ways. Uh, you'll probably be relieved that I'm not, not normally in the habit of quoting Winston Churchill, uh, but I do find his famous or infamous allusion to the, quote, dreary steeples of Fermanagh and Tyrone, uh, a usefully provocative starting point for this presentation. It epitomizes a perception of the Northern Ireland conflict as unchanging and also permeated by religion. Both assumptions, which ha are, have, of course, come increasingly to be questioned and tested by events. It is, though, a uh, concept that has a resonance that's cast a long shadow over the last 90 years, and one that continues to provide food for thought as we move into the decade of centenaries that will end uh, in 2022. So I want this afternoon to reflect a bit on how the role of religion in Northern Ireland has been changing and not changing in recent years, and then at the end to offer some pointers for constructive policy engagement. I want first to say a bit about the particular research project I've led, so as to give you a bit of a sense of the context of the background of what I have to say. Then I want to look for a few minutes at the situation of religion in Northern Ireland in a wider comparative framework, something that I think isn't often done, but can suggest some significant out-of-the-box thinking. Then I'll go on to share some key insights from our specific Northern Ireland research, briefly mention some further research which is still ongoing, and conclude by suggesting some possible policy implications. I first mention that the research I'm talking about today was funded as part of a Research Council's UK Global Uncertainties Programme. And uh, this slide uh, shows some key facts and figures about this initiative, uh, which is now almost exactly at its uh, midway point uh, between uh, 2008 and, uh, and 2018. There's a very strong emphasis on interdisciplinarity and on public and policy engagement and impact. I'm personally a historian by training, so I come from this from a different uh, academic kind of background from our previous two speakers. And I'm also a long-standing member of the Religious Studies Department at the Open University. And perhaps as an uh, opportunity to say as the first Open University speaker, I think, in this uh, series, what a pleasure and privilege it is to be uh, taking part. Uh, Hence, when I was formulating a proposal in response to a call for the ideas and belief strand of, uh, of the Global Uncertainties Programme, I sought to bring together my historical interests with analysis of contemporary religion. In particular, I was interested in considering how the long view of anti-Catholicism had applications not only to understanding present-day Northern Ireland, but to providing useful comparisons and contexts for understanding Islamophobia across the UK which is something I might say rather more about in a, uh, in, uh, in, a, in a context outside Northern Ireland. I found an ideal partner in the Institute for Conflict Research here in Belfast with their expertise in on-the-ground community-based research, complementing my skills as an archival researcher. And a small trailer that the project has so far generated two books, and the slide shows the cover of one of them, Protestant Catholic Conflict from the Reformation to the 21st Century and a second book, more specifically, on Irish religious conflict in comparative perspective, uh, will come out next year. And I've included the references to these in the briefing paper. So I move on now to the uh, first main substantive uh, section of the presentation, setting Northern Ireland in a comparative and historical context. And five key points I'd like to make, the first three on this slide. First, when one looks at Catholic-Protestant relations elsewhere during the 19th century, Northern Ireland does not look nearly as distinctive as it does in the 20th century. Sectarian antagonisms were widespread, not only in northwest England and the west of Scotland, but in Australia, Canada, and the northern United States. Elsewhere, however, sectarianism has substantially reduced, although its sometimes problematic legacy still remains. And I think the extent to which it does is sometimes underestimated. 
Hence, to cut a long story short, the particular intensity and persistence of sectarianism in Northern Ireland's recent history can be attributed primarily to specific political circumstances. And hence, a changing political context arguably offers hope for long term, but in the short term, attitudes on the ground are likely only to change slowly. My second point is that religious antagonisms are multifaceted and closely interwoven with other factors. That's something I could expand on at, at length, but I have only time to make the general observation now that it does make the blanket assertion that the conflict is or is not religious uh, a rather problematic one. And third, I do think it's useful to bear in mind the significant similarities in the content of anti-Catholic polemic and some other forms of religious and racial antagonism, such as Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. To give just one example, uh, in a wider European context, reactions to distinctive forms of women's dress, whether nuns' habits or the Islamic burqa. In both the US and in other parts of the UK, I'd argue that since the 1980s, we've seen the transference of hostilities and suspicions onto Muslims that were historically directed against Catholics. That's a shift that has, like, that has uh, yet to become very much apparent in Northern Ireland, but something that I think may well become an issue in the future and one needs to be sensitive to in view of the uh, uh, increasingly uh, diverse and multicultural nature of Northern Ireland itself. My fourth uh, broad point is that I'd uh, like to stress there was uh, historically and in the present, no inevitability that religious difference leads to religious conflict. Peaceful coexistence was and is widespread. Such situations, though, can be easily destabilised, sometimes, and this is something I've emphasised, by people with the best of intentions who are seeking to remove underlying tensions. On the other hand, well-judged leadership initiatives really can make a difference. But historical experience suggests that good timing and presentation are crucial. Finally, in this uh, general section, I'd make a rather counterintuitive point. Secularization should not be seen as providing a solution to religious conflict. On the contrary, I think uh, across the UK, we're seeing a, a problem with a growing uh, religious illiteracy. And I was interested to see uh, Akhil Ahmed of the BBC writing about this uh, only, week, uh, only this weekend uh, in the newspaper, which can lead to misunderstanding antagonism towards a remaining actively religious minority. And I think uh, there can also be a trend that breeds insecurity and instability as people lose traditional cultural reference points and it diminishes the potential of religious leaders themselves to be effective peace builders. So I now move on to my uh, next section, uh, which is to summarise some of the insights from our more specific research on Northern Ireland. And uh, we, that is uh, myself and uh, our collaborators at the uh, Institute for Conflict Research, interviewed a sample of 52 anonymous respondents and a further uh, 14 uh, key informants. Uh, the key informants were uh, identified people who had uh, taken uh, so some kind of sort of prominent role in religious uh, peace building uh, during the Troubles. Uh, people such as uh, uh, Howard Good, uh, uh, Jerry Reynolds, uh, Lord Eames, uh, or had more prominent roles in religious or political affairs. Uh, for example, we talked to uh, Bernadette Michalowski. And uh, this slide, though, indicates the uh, makeup of the anonymous sample, where we uh, tried very hard to achieve a balance of gender and of people from Protestant and Catholic uh, inverted commas backgrounds. And I'll come on to uh, the, uh, the use of these categories in a moment. We also sought to uh, cover quite a wide spectrum of ages although there uh, was a predominance in the sample uh, of uh, those uh, uh, in their 40s and 50s. And uh, we uh, specifically didn't interview uh, anyone under 18. And uh, also to get a cross-section of religious practice from uh, committed regular churchgoers 
uh, to those who uh, never went to church except perhaps for uh, special occasions such as weddings and funerals. And the sample was also uh, regionally diverse, uh, drawn from uh, Greater Belfast, from uh, South Armagh, and from a uh, more scattered uh, range of locations west of the ban. The uh, interviews uh, themselves were carried out between uh, mid-2010 and mid-2012, uh, largely by John Bell at the Institute of Conflict Research, uh, although I took uh, part in some of them. And John has produced a detailed report, which we've got the front cover on the slide, uh, which is available on the ICR website. Again, I seem to be thinking in uh, fives this afternoon, but uh, five key points I'd like to make from the uh, specific Northern Ireland work. Uh, first, as one would expect, the great majority of our respondents self-identified as either Catholic or Protestant. However, uh, there was a significant minority who were evidently uh, more or less uncomfortable with these terms. Uh, when they were asked as how they would self-identify themselves in religious and other terms. Uh, in some cases, uh, this was because uh, they were uh, non-religious and uh, wanted to distance themselves from their, uh, relig uh, from their religious upbringing background. Uh, but in others, interestingly, uh, they were committed churchgoers who, prepared, who preferred to self-identify themselves as Christian or perhaps by some kind of denominational identity other than uh, uh, but a broad category of Protestant or Catholic. And uh, perhaps that trend was most apparent among sort of younger uh, evangelical uh, uh, Protestants. Uh, but also, interestingly, we did find it among a few younger Catholics. A second point uh, is that even uh, some of those who did not go to church regularly still uh, significantly identified uh, with Christianity. And two examples of that uh, were actually sending their children to Sunday school uh, or uh, saying at least that they uh, prayed uh, on a very regular basis or perhaps took part in uh, some kind of uh, uh, more occasional uh, organised religious function such as a pilgrimage. A third point is that certainly among our sample, uh, stereotypes of the other tradition were quite widespread. And even disconcertingly, uh, stereotypes of uh, perhaps of a more subtle kind uh, were still being held by people of considerable goodwill uh, who professed themselves very committed to peace building and a shared future. But there seemed to be no correlation uh, with levels of church going. Uh, and we found both some of the most open and some of the most stereotyped attitudes among regular churchgoers. And it seems that the key factor uh, was rather the extent to which respondents had had some kind of meaningful contact with people of the other tradition. An encouraging finding, though, I think, was that uh, when one looked at views of history, which was something we did try to explore, that uh, more critical and less polarised views uh, seemed to be coming through uh, than I think is uh, often supposed. A fourth point is that there uh, was a lot of evidence uh, from our interviews of individual and local church initiatives to promote peace and a shared future, both during the Troubles and since the Good Friday Agreement. However, in tension with that, there was an equally widespread perception that the churches could have done more in the past or should be doing more in the present. So uh, I think that leads us to a, a, a similar conclusion to John Brewer's recent research, uh, with which some of you may be familiar, in pointing to uh, a tension between uh, a institu perceived institutional inertia uh, in the organised churches, but uh, very significant and creative leadership and initiative by individuals and sort of uh, local uh, religious organisations at the grassroots. Uh, I think also, though, our research points to the churches being subject to some unrealistic expectations and also to a considerable variety of local experience, which was reflected in the different kind of responses uh, we got. Finally, I'd like to emphasise that religion, like security, is a fluid concept in Northern Ireland and elsewhere, both in academic discourse and in the minds of people on the ground. In particular, we'd argue that a stable future 
requires an effective balance between physical security on the one hand and more intangible but highly important needs of individuals and communities for some kind of sense of cultural security. When people feel their cultural security is threatened, they are liable to become overly self-assertive, as, for example, we've seen in the uh, recent loyalist flag protests. And I suggest that the churches still have some significant capacity to provide an alternative and potentially less confrontational focus for these kind of needs. I'll conclude in a moment by drawing out some implications for policy. But first, just briefly to make you aware of uh, some more ongoing research, which is funded from a further grant from the Global Uncertainties Program under the theme of Religion, Martyrdom and Global Uncertainties, 1914 to 2014. This is designed to do two main things. To provide some kind of accessible academic uh, ac synthesis of current academic thinking on this interface between uh, these problematic concepts of religion and of security. And secondly, to do some uh, new specific detailed research around historical and contemporary views of martyrdom and forms of sort of perceived sacrificial death in Britain and Ireland since 1914. And uh, as will, may probably be obvious to you, there are potentially significant implications here for thinking about how the 1914 and 1916 centenaries are marked. So what then are the policy implications? I uh, have the perhaps unkind perception that sometimes policymakers, not least in Northern Ireland, often have a sense that religion is too sensitive and difficult to understand and potentially explosive uh, to risk uh, touching the do not touch uh, mentality. And perhaps there's a continuity here from Churchill's disparaging reference to the dreary steeples to Alistair Campbell's equally famous advice to Tony Blair that we don't do God. This is very understandable, especially in relation to Northern Ireland. Nevertheless, I'd want to advocate a more constructive and positive kind of uh, sort of handle with care uh, attitude. Uh, specifically, uh, a few, uh, a few uh, points, about, uh, not on the level of policy recommendations, but some specific implications to draw out. First, there's surely uh, value in finding ways of giving rather greater recognition and encouragement to uh, that rel religiously committed minority we've come across who are uncomfortable with the Catholic Protestant binary, rather than, uh, however inadvertently, forcing them back into categories that they're, uh, that they're questioning. That would surely be a positive step in moving towards a shared rather than a shared out future. Secondly, I wonder if there is scope for giving greater support to work already being done by the churches, often with very limited human and financial resources, both in uh, reaching out and addressing issues of uh, deprivation and exclusion in their own natural constituencies, and in relation to uh, bridge building work. And I was very, uh, very interested in the last speaker's uh, ideas of how we uh, rethink uh, community uh, uh, boundaries to bring Catholic and Protestant uh, communities into closer contact in that way. Their role and potential could, I think, be recognized more than it apparently is in the recent Building a United Community document. Thirdly, however, I do think our work highlights the need for caution in pursuing the shared future agenda, lest well-intentioned but premature and less than fully considered policies provoke a backlash. I'd argue that this risk is increased precisely because of the decline of historical religious practice, which diminishes the potential of churches to be a stabilizing force. Fourth, there does seem to be a real hunger for public education to set the upcoming centenaries in proper historical context. An important part of this could be a critical re-evaluation of the past role of the churches in Irish politics as a springboard for reassessing their role in the future. Finally, a more general point. Obviously, there are many distinctive features of the situation in Northern Ireland. Nevertheless, it does seem to me that both the academic and policy discussion about the role of religion would be enriched by engaging more with a wider UK ROI 
and indeed European and North Atlantic context. As Northern Ireland becomes increasingly multicultural rather than bicultural, there's surely a scope for applying experience from other jurisdictions. Conversely, while the emphasis of my presentation has been on the work that has still to be done here, the experience of the last 20 years yields many positive stories of mitigating antagonisms that deserve to be shared with those seeking to address and preempt parallel problems elsewhere. Thank you very much.